you're on. My name is Beverly Sanders, and today is Friday, November 4th, 2016. I'm here today with uh, Merrill Dean at McFarland United Methodist Church in Norman, Oklahoma. Joe Sanders will be assisting with the recording equipment and sometimes adding a question. This interview is for the historical records of McFarland United Methodist Church as well as the Voices of Oklahoma United Methodist Project of the Oklahoma Conference Oral History Research Program. This research program is coordinated through the Commission on Archives and History with the support of the Oklahoma United Methodist Historical Society. Merle, yes. I certainly appreciate your being with us today. Well, it's my pleasure. And, uh, it's always, always good to, to see you and always good to uh, talk to you and uh, hear about the, your memories of McFarland. So would you just begin by introducing yourself, tell us about where you were born, your family history, education, and uh, anything else that uh, you would like to add? Okay. Well cover all those? Do we have an hour and a half? <laughs> well, the, the, the short version. <laughs> okay, well, I was born uh, in Lexington, Kentucky, and uh, grew up there, and went through the high school there, and uh, University of Kentucky, graduated in 58, and immediately went into the Air Force. Okay. And I uh, uh, served in the Air Force uh, for 24 years. About half of that was flying assignments, the other half uh, were like planning assignments and things of that nature. And, and then I taught six years at Air University in Montgomery, Alabama. So it was a very good career. Uh, I enjoyed it. It was a great way uh, to spend a, a devoted lifetime. And I, I, uh, I and my family uh, moved, but not as often as many people did, so it was a good career through all so that time. You say you and your family moved. Was that after you were married to Sherman? Or That's that? correct. After uh, Sherman and I were married, and then we had two sons that came along later, Stephen and Michael, and uh, they're in their 50s now, which has, oh, <laughs> tells you a lot. They grow up, don't they? <laughs> Have their own families, but uh, we're very proud of them and uh, stay in touch quite often, each and every week. So it was a it was a good upbringing, and then after I got out of the uh, Air Force, I went to work uh, for a bank here in Norman for a year. During that time, I got my insurance license, and then from there went into uh, uh, the securities industry, and uh, devoted 33 years to that. And uh, so, a few years ago, I sold my securities business and then concentrated on the insurance side of my business. And so for the last six years, I've been doing exclusively uh, life insurance, uh, disability uh, protection, and long-term care for families. So it's been a good life. I've been very blessed. Well, let's way, back, uh, back up just a little bit to tell us how and when you met Sherma and when, when and where you were married. Well, it's ironic. Uh, I met when I was going through flight training at uh, Randolph Air Force Base in San Antonio. Oh, yes. Then uh, there were four of us uh, guys and we go going in the processing there were some guys processing out and they said hey do you need a place to stay and, uh, and we said sure you know so they had a uh, apartment they were renting in north uh, San Antonio at the time and so we moved into it and about the third or fourth day that we were there then there was a knock on my door and there was a lovely looking girl from across <laughs> the hall who knocked on my door and, and wanted to know if I were uh, Meryl Dean. I said, yes. She said, well, you have a call on my phone. Oh. <laughs> oh, my. And uh, how did that come about? It was because my mother worked for the telephone company oh. <laughs> back in Lexington, and she hadn't heard from me for, oh. uh, for two weeks. Oh, my. And she, she was wondering, you know, what happened to me, and I hadn't been writing enough and things like that. So that's how Sherman and I met. We, uh, uh, in three months, uh, we became engaged, and three months later we were married in 1959. And uh, again, it's been a, a great journey with her. And uh, if not for her taking care of me, and also particularly uh, taking care of the boys and really raising a family while I was in the Air Force, that, that we wouldn't be in uh, such a great state that we are today. And 
having such a good life. But uh, after I retired from the Air Force, I figured out that uh, of the 24 years, I was gone eight years oh my. out of that 24. And so she basically, you know, raised the kids, several times. raised the kids all that time, and they came out of it very well. And, uh, and I think that in, in itself, it's why they themselves are productive in their own lives. And so it's worked well. And so then after that, then I came into uh, the financial business. And Georgia. you said that you had, uh, you worked at a bank in Norman. For uh, how did you happen to get from from San Antonio and Lexington, Kentucky? How did uh, you wind well, up in Norman? I uh, I came back to uh, let's see how did all that happen? <laughs> I'm just trying to think now. I came back. Yeah, that's it. I came back to. Uh, Oklahoma University or to uh, uh, University of Oklahoma on a uh, okay. scholarship from the Air Force. I see. Uh -huh. And uh, so spent time here three years. So we bought our house here and then uh, left and went to teach at their university. And while we were, uh, and, and uh, right after that, at leaving their university, oh, while we were at the university for three years, I, we rented our house here, just kept mm -hmm. kept the house uh, in the event that we ever got back here. Well, lo and behold, after I went to uh, the Philippines for 15 months, the family came back here during that time. And so uh, we've been uh, really all settled in here since 70, 74, the family has. And uh, so it's uh, that's how we've remained right here. In, Norman, we uh, the boys were uh, leaving high school at the time, so it was uh, just just didn't seem right. It was college right here in town to get up and move uh, at any time, so I just stayed right here and went to work here in the local area. So your boys went to OU also? It, yes, they went to University of Oklahoma. Did they, did they come to McFarland here at that time while you were at home? With us, the, yes. That was my next question was, how did you happen to uh, wind up coming to church at McFarland? Well, it was Sherma's idea. She remembered McFarland from when she had been a student here. She know, had already she, been at McFarland while you were, the time she came to stay here. No, I don't know if they really attended the church or not in my absence. Uh -huh. uh, uh, but uh, I know once we really got settled in and from 74 on, then uh, uh -huh. she just had fond memories of the majesty of the, of the uh, sanctuary and things okay. like that. So that's how we came and a few times and enjoyed uh, uh, Reverend Phil Finn's sermons and then had some friends in the local area. They suggested to uh, come in and join their Sunday school, which we did. And uh, we're with the, with the church for many, many years after that. So um, you came in 74. Uh, who, do you Full remember time. who was a minister at that time? I think now, 70, Phil. 74, might I say. I think Phil was. Phil I think Phil was already. I think well, so. No, he didn't come in 74. I mean. Yeah, he didn't come until 79. No, 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 I'm talking about Earl didn't come until 74. You didn't retire until when? Retired in 78? Yes, I retired. Oh, okay, okay. So, okay. so Phil would have already been here. Yeah. Okay, and you said that you, uh, your first involvement was by getting into a Sunday school class. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and that class... We were we were uh, invited by some friends that and, I knew. And, uh, did the class have a name at that time? Well, it probably did, but I can't remember it. Uh -huh. <laughs> so did you did you want to stay with the, the same Sunday school class all the time you were we, here? The whole time. Is yeah, that it's the whole time? And I don't know. If, maybe we did have a name. I just. Well, can't I think remember. it was a summit class. That's what Charlotte well, talked about. Well, it could have been. Uh -huh. See, she would remember mm -hmm. things like that. <laughs> and I guess it didn't take uh, people at McFarland very long to recognize. That you were good leadership material, and yeah. I think if I'm remembering right, you soon got tagged for serving on different committees. Well, yes, you know, at that time in my life, uh, I didn't know that, how to say no, and, <laughs> and, uh, and so when Phil Finn asked, uh, then it was very easy to uh, want to be a part. And, uh, it's hard to say no to Phil Finn. Yes, <laughs> yeah. I admired him so much. So I started out on the uh, uh, spiritual committee. 
and then became head of that, and then after that went on the administrative board, and then later became head of the administrative board. And then uh, uh, right about that time, toward the end of my time there with the board, if I remember correctly, uh, then that's when the idea of a foundation for McFarland came to see. And there had been a lady who had uh, uh, wanted to contribute. She lived in Virginia or some other state. She wanted to contribute some money to McFarland. So Phil uh, asked if I would, you know, look into that and things, what have you. And so with that seed money, then we started the idea of the McFarland Foundation, which is to give a gift that, that lives. Yeah. So explain forever. to us how a foundation works. Well, it's basically built in order to, it's a separate uh, entity from the church per se. Uh, but, but it's under the church, it, it really, in all guys. And uh, it was set up in order to uh, take contributions, and then it was divided out, it depended upon what the contributor wanted to be done with the money. It could be partitioned for that purpose, uh, such as, say, for the organ, or uh, for a sound system, or for uh, general operating. Expenses and things and laid out in different uh, buckets, so that we would be able to then, uh, you know, meet the wishes of the person who was contributing. So we started the uh, foundation and had some nice brochures made, and we had the uh, there was, uh, Buddy Pendarvis was our legal advisor, and uh, then we, uh, for a very nominal fee, we. Uh, able to contact a, a firm, a PR type firm, but a fundraising firm out of Dallas, and uh, they helped us. In fact, they really did most of the work on publishing brochures mm -hmm. and how to get the word out and things of that nature. So we uh, we started off with the bang, and, and it worked out very well. And, Hope it's still sustaining it's itself and doing a lot of good. Going strong, as I understand. Yeah. Uh, do I got to have it right that the money that is donated stays in the foundation, and, and only the interest or earnings from that money are are then given to projects and things? Well, like at times, and we also use the principal at times. Use one. You also principal, use the principal at times. If uh, for a certain uh -huh. uh, function. I see. But it was primarily the the earnings off that. Of course, this was back in the times. Where there were good earnings from CDs, oh, yes. <laughs> Cert yeah. certificates of yeah. deposit. Now we don't see that as yeah. much. So probably will be I, I don't know sometime. how it's being invested now, but uh, but uh, that was the main function, and it was keep it safe, uh, keep the money coming in, and then using the, uh, the interest primarily in order to meet the, the needs of the contributor plus the needs of the church. And, and I was glad we got that got that got that started. Was, it, was a foundation kind of a new concept, or kind of a new idea at that time? For I you. remember that the Norman Public Schools were forming one sometime along well, they, they about that time. Well, they may have. They just may have. And but we, it, we uh, just, were them just beginning to hear about yeah. that sort of thing. But it worked. Of course, foundations have been in existence for hundreds of years okay. Uh, okay. here in the United States. So we just you know, borrowed from their principles and what have you. And, and, uh, and I think it was a very good uh, vehicle by which to meet some needs that uh, weren't uh, ongoing, but it took the stress definitely off of the, the church budget. And at the same time, met the, the uh, giving needs of a number of people uh, who had an attachment one way uh, or the other uh, with the part. It could have been through their children who went to OU here. It could have been uh, themselves who had attended the church. And uh, so, uh, it, it's, uh, I'm glad to see that it's still working out well. And so then you were the first chair of the McFarland Foundation. That's correct. Uh, that's, the um, uh, other committees uh, and things that you were on, served on other committees. You said you first started out with the spiritual committee. committee okay, uh -huh. and then uh, I'm sure you must have been on finance at some time. Well, not directly financed, but uh -huh. I was on there when I was a member of the administrative board. You know, as 
as a member of the administrative board, okay. you go to every meeting. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and so uh, that was that, that uh, allowed and, and me eventually to participate. You served as the chair of the that's correct. Tell us about chairing the and, administrative board. Well, it was quite a task, uh -huh. a good task, because of the fact that we had people from all different divisions, but and including staff uh, from all the committees, uh, uh, come and, and give us their ideas and proposals for increasing uh, their contributions, their uh, their desire to make McFarland better. Some of which. Uh, could do given our budget at the time, uh, some of which we couldn't. Probably the overall thing that I remember about the administrative board, what it was very big and unwieldy. It was. Oh, and oh, uh, they have they have <laughs> pared it down now. It's much smaller. Well, I'm glad. I, if I remember correctly, if everybody came, we'd have 20 some odd people there. Oh. So okay. I had to have a, a definite agenda and try to keep people as close to that agenda uh -huh. as possible. But it worked out well by doing that, and, uh, and so there's, there's a lot of different functions, a lot of different things that need to be met day in and day out in the church, particularly one of this size, and everybody needs their input. But uh, uh, it, it, uh, I'm glad it has reduced its size, most likely by doing so. Doing so, by doing so, I'm sure it's become much more efficient. But we. We made it as, as tight as we could at the I time. See. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, you were on the trustees at least once. Tell us about being a trustee. Well, you know, I don't know if I, I don't remember if I were directly on the trust as a trustee member, other than as a member, as the head of the administrative board. Oh, I see. I think that's why I was uh, participating with the board of trustees and particularly. Uh, during the time that they were uh, involved in uh, building the new addition to the farm, okay. because that involved that the impact of that, both in planning and the dis disbursement of funds and what have you, uh, involved uh, so many things within the church that the administrative board member had to be there, had to be providing inputs from that standpoint. You've, you've mentioned uh, the uh, building of the new addition, so let's talk about that. Uh, uh, I say, I, I'm sure you were involved in, in several ways in that, in that building. I think it was hard to be a member of McFarland at the time and not be involved in, in, the, in getting ready for the new building. Yes. So tell us uh, about your involvement in it and how things developed there. Well, it's a matter of, you know, attending the, uh, I can remember all the different designs and the engineers that had to be uh, brought down to one that we had confidence in, and, uh, and, and all the, then after that, all the various designs of what could be done and what couldn't be done, given all the uh, changes that had happened in construction and in materials from the time that the original church was built, and so uh, a meshing of new materials and colors and technology and things of that nature were, uh, were vitally important and took, took quite a bit of time and at times I think raised the cost but I think it was well worth it by oh, the yes. time we got the whole thing together mm -hmm. and saw, uh, saw exactly how it could meld with the older part of the church and I, I think it's just a beautiful Addition, and it really has probably become, in many ways, uh, more used than uh, the, the original church. Oh yes, yes. Was at the time. Yeah. Now, I know that the, the having an addition was talked about for years and years and years. But do you have any memory of when it actually kind of surfaced as a something we really were going to get busy and do? No, I, I just no, really, no, really don't. No, no concept of the. When they no, actually started I mean, it just them. sort of swept up and things like that. Yeah. It wasn't like one day somebody said, oh, let's have a new addition. No. But I think the push for a new addition, well, particularly space, mm -hmm. in order to get more things done by the church and by the church staff mm -hmm. in 
in order to meet the needs of the congregation is what really drove uh, drove the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, need, the drove us to say hey we need more space but if we're going to do more space let's do it in, in a very beautiful way that doesn't conflict with uh, what the grandeur we already have here with the original apartment building. So it sort of swept itself up and came up through the uh, administrative board. And, uh, and so that's, that's how we got it started. Just exactly, there wasn't any like flint that sparked. That, so were you, uh, in, were you chairing the administrative board through the whole construction? Of, yes. See, uh -huh. And Sherma has told us that she was um, chairing the planning committee of getting the architects and the plans all together for yes, it. Yes, and that was, I think, when she was on the board of trustees. Mm -hmm. But uh, yes, that she spent a lot of time on that. I was yes, very you, proud of her. I think you both did. We were, we yeah. were blessed to have you both at that time. <laughs> Do you think of anything else involving the construction that we should talk about? No, not really. We looked at a lot of different plates, a lot of different designs, a lot of different uh, pieces of uh, stone, and, uh, and uh, but it was worth it. Oh, All yes. the time spent uh, in, in designing and, uh, and making those decisions, uh, I think it's paid off in many, many ways for the church. Hope it is, it is continue the growth of the church, but that's that's why we need it. We need the space in order to continue the growth of the church. Yes. And, uh, and I think it has done so. Well. People have just, we just moved into it uh, thoroughly, and you know, the, this is, is used so so much. Yeah. Just so many activities that uh, yeah. make you wonder how we ever got along without I mean, it. Because church is a living organism. It it. it uh, really is used and breathes every night. There's something going on or could be going on every night in this church and I suspect it is. Just about. And so that's why you need a, a, a space that's available through a, an extra building yes. like this. But you got to make sure it, 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 it carries on the tradition uh, exterior wise to what was already provided to us. We will be coming up soon uh, in uh, 2024 to the 100th anniversary of the original building. Yeah, that's great. And it'll be the 135th anniversary of Methodism and Norman from well, 1889 wonder. when the two churches yeah. came. Together. So it'll be it'll be quite an occasion. Um, let's talk about then uh, any any McFarland people or incidents that stand out in your mind. Well, you've, you've talked about Phil Finn. What a wonderful Phil, leader he yeah, was. Yeah, he was. He, he really he was, a, he was a good preacher, but he was a tireless worker. As I mentioned earlier, uh, all the committees that uh, he would be asked to sit in on, and I, at times I would say, Phil, you don't need to be there. You don't need to be there in all those meetings. Uh, let all... let that come up through the administrative board. Be at the administrative board meetings and of course your input where you can hear more things across the board in, in, a, in a better way and where you'd be more efficient with your time and your input. But it, uh, I don't think he listened to my advice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, do you have any dealing with Harold Munich by any chance? Somewhat, a little bit, because of the finance. Harold was uh, was our financial guru, and he always provided the reports and uh, laboriously and did that for years and years and years. Were you aware that uh, we were had savings accounts that were over fifty thousand dollars in yeah. one place, and that Harold got a hold of that and made sure we spread that money out properly? Well, I, I'm sure I did. I, I don't. I don't know when it would have happened. Uh, and I'm, I'm approaching 80, I can tell you exactly each and everything like that. I, Those dates get away from you, don't they? Yeah, I, uh, I do remember one a small little thing, but back during one of the basketball seasons, and uh, OU had good basketball teams, 
and uh, there was to be a Sunday game at Lloyd Noble, and I was I was uh, head of the spiritual committee then, and it was going to be started it was to be televised like at eleven thirty or twelve, something like that on a Sunday. Well, members on the spiritual committee didn't think that was right. <laughs> they conflict uh, with church uh, and church uh, doors and everything. And, I, and I, they wanted to write uh, the TV networks and, uh, and uh, the local TV channel and say, don't put that on and it, all the reasons why not. And everything. said, no, no, let's, let's don't do anything like that. Let, well, let's, Put it in a, in a put in a letter if you like, and we'll send it to Phil. And then he is the leader of the church. Let him decide what to do with it. Yeah. And uh, and, and it's a small little thing, but it's somehow that's oh, mm -hmm. been well, that's kept in my thing. mind. You know. That's the way those things go. That's the things you remember. <laughs> so I won on that. But we didn't we didn't take it any further uh, than where it was. That was good. <laughs> yeah. uh, other ministers that you remember during your time here? Well, see. Kyle, Kyle Brennan. came uh, toward the end and, uh -huh. uh, after that and a uh, uh, very nice gentleman and uh, good, good preacher. Oh, yes. But you know there's something about it. As we go, you know, well the, the original one is always the best. Uh -huh. You know and it's hard for someone to come in and uh, surpass yeah. what what years of uh, listening to and being devoted to the uh, mm -hmm. preacher that was here when you joined. So it's always it's a, it's a, it's always hard for that follow on uh, oh, leader so. to uh, to be recognized as well as they should, and it's unfortunate. It's like whoever, okay, who follows Michael, Michael Jackson, or yep. you know, or who, <laughs> who follows uh, Michael Jordan on the basketball court? Uh -huh. Whether uh, no matter how good some would have been, they, they wouldn't have been that good as Michael Jordan. So I, I always thought, even as a child, I always thought ministers must have an awfully hard time having to constantly move, and they're either following somebody so good that they can't live up See, to them, or so it. bad that everybody's yeah. expecting wonders from them. Yes. So it's uh, uh, must be. Well, and you know, that's one thing about the Methodist Church, and I guess it has its good size, side, but also the bad, it's that uh, uh, teach, uh, preachers, if I remember correctly, are really pretty much assigned yeah. to a God congregation with, uh, with very little input by the on the part of the congregation, in order to see if there's a there's a meeting of the minds and the hearts, uh, and knowing uh, you know who they would be most. Of course, you don't want a congregation to be comfortable all the time. But on the other hand, because they need to be going forward spiritually. But on the other hand, uh, uh, having someone brought in uh, without an input from the local folks is. Can be can be an impediment. Yeah, I believe at this point there's a lot more consultation both with with the church they're going to and with the minister himself than there used to be well, back in the good. old days in the that's 30s good. and 40s. I think it was pretty much just a surprise to everybody. Yeah. But uh, uh, the I believe like the uh, what they call it, staff parish relation committee has been uh, consulted yeah. in, well, the, in the recent changes. And, that's good. and so that uh, it's things are kind of changing in the church, I guess, just like they are everywhere else. Yeah. Um, you were uh, aware at the time of the wiring of the property that we currently have. Uh, you know, the, uh, the, we only had what uh, five sections, I believe it was, of the, of the corner of the land of the land here. Whenever you, whenever you were the, uh, you, were you involved at all? In yes, we were. We were involved in that, and uh, I remember in buying the houses and meeting the the uh, owners correct price and it seemed like there was one that was a holdout. As usual, there's always one that's a holdout. And so we had to wait quite a little while. 
Is that right? I remember that. We had yeah, well, quite... the one right back there also. Well, yeah. that was my spec there, though. It was this one here. Yeah, I remember that. So it required a bit of patience and constant talking to the people. And, and uh, we had a real estate, I remember. James McCall. Yes. I remember so Phil talking about the James. Was very close contact with with the families that were uh, hesitant, and uh, and then Phil himself did. Yeah. And uh, met every need, and, and always you know, paid personal visits to them, and always you know nice type thing. And, and uh, I think that finally was what caused it. And if I remember correctly. One of the families uh, was, it was a widow, and she had become quite aged. And so uh, her, her sons and daughters uh, felt it was time for her to get some work. Okay. So it was again, it was a matter of patience and waiting out the, yeah. the time, and, and then having the money in order to uh, make the purchase. You know, I hadn't really realized that. I was asking about when the idea became, you know, actually started to be something that could happen. I'm sure that was after the land was. Secure. Well, we were already talking about it and laying plans for that uh, prior to the to the uh, property being bought, which I think again was good planning. That's why at one time they were talking about building that direction instead of this way. Yeah. Because uh, a building north rather than building out west or the east rather, because we weren't sure we were going to get this corner down here until. Yeah. How about, um, I'm talking about people, uh, Jean Powell who was a fixture in the office for so long. Oh yes, she you, was. Uh, Phil always liked to talk about uh, Jean when he first came here, uh, brand new, that Jean uh, told him uh, you know, a lot of things and they said, and you don't touch my parking place. <laughs> and so, but uh, yeah. did you have any, uh, any any memories of Jean Powell? Oh, just good memories. Just good memories. Yes, she, was, she just, you know, it's big organization, large organizations, uh, and I consider take in the whole congregation it's it's a large organization uh, McFarland is but uh, it seems like you need that continuity that you need the history uh, she knew where ever skeleton was where uh, someone who died someone who didn't mm -hmm. that helped a lot yeah. on, uh, on, on the foundation and allowing us to know who to contact uh, and uh, and so uh, I always respected her for what she did, and she was a very devoted lady, and, uh, and just uh, gave her life basically to, to the church. And she told us once that she had personally been on every inch of that building, including the attic over the sanctuary. Well, I'm sure that's true. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you think about anything else, any any other uh, McFarland incidents or people or happenings that she, you should mention? You know, I'm not, not really that. I, I know sometimes uh, Phil and I in our lunches and things together, we have a little uh, diversity of, uh, of views of where the church, not McFarland, but with Methodist church as a whole, should be going how it should, and where it should be. We always, you know, laughed, but not to laugh, but you know, you know, met each other halfway on things. But I, at one time, uh, he uh, was nice enough to to uh, take a letter that I and the uh, my vice chair. Uh, at what you and who? I and my vice chair had oh. written up concerning something that the. Uh, Church and Society Board in D.C. had done, and which really had, I thought an adverse impact on all the congregations. And uh, so, after a couple of meetings, he agreed to sign it and send it forward. I don't know whatever wow. happened. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, in fact, you you have led right to another question that I have. Yes. It's basically I know that you and Sherman have moved to another church now, mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, this is kind of what should be the goal of Christianity in the future. What would you like to see happen in the Christianity of the world of the future? 
well. Oh. Well, I'd like to see it be uh, the uh, code of conduct by which uh, we all live. Uh, and and the only, only way that can happen, I think, is for people to know what I consider uh, is the, the basis of the code of conduct, conduct, and that is the Old and the New Testament. And if there's something that, that bothers me about the last 30 years, and looking back at least, is that, is that there, as a nation, we are not following it. We're not following the, uh, the Bible. And part of that, I think, is because it's not being taught well enough, and enough, period, uh, from the pulpit. And, uh, and so I think we have we've reached a number of generations now who have no moral foundation of what is right and what is wrong. I see. Because now it's a matter, it just seems like everything is right. And uh, there is no wrong in the Bible. What is it? Warns us about where you know right becomes wrong and wrong becomes right. And I think we've been living through decades of that now. We're paying the uh, we're paying the price as a country. And I think it's I, I think the churches ought to become more boisterous about uh, getting that information into the hearts and minds of their congregations. Christianity, not, not only here, but around the world. In fact, Christianity, because it's based upon the Bible and the fundamentals so much, is, uh, is uh, moving faster in other places around the world than it is here in the U.S. Uh, yeah. And I think uh, uh, you know, Africa and, and uh, South America and uh, not so much in the Far East and Middle East, but in those areas, were only congregations, the only, not only, but the primary text they have in their preachers is the Bible, rather than sociologists and psychologists yeah. uh, uh, expounding things and then being used for the pulpit. I think that's why they're moving and they're much stronger than we are in, in their beliefs nowadays. You know, that's a, it's, uh, it's not to damn all the things that are going on in churches today, but I will say, I think for many years, the churches across our country have abdicated their responsibility to get the Word of God firmly implanted in the hearts and minds of the congregation. Well, I appreciate uh, your, your opinions, and I appreciate your being here with us today. You given us some really interesting stories and some interesting information. Well, and, I hope uh, so. We so appreciate your taking time out of your busy day to come to be with us. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank Beverly. you. I really appreciate it.